name is Bill Lawrence. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean at Perkins School of Theology. And it is my honor, great privilege, to welcome you tonight to this extraordinarily special occasion. As Perkins School of Theology has the opportunity to present the Distinguished Alumni Awards for 2015 to two exceptional people who have dedicated themselves to long lives of ministry and service. There are some persons in the room whom I want to invite you to join me in welcoming. First, we have a number of persons who are previous recipients of the Distinguished Alumni Award. I can't call all of their names as I'm standing here, but I'll try to do that if previous recipients of the Perkins Distinguished Alumni Award would stand in your place and allow us to greet you. Bishop John Wesley Hart, Bishop Joe Wilson, Dr. Zan Holmes, Dr. Roberto Escamilla, please join me. Now, two of the recipients have stood and just sat down, and I'm going to ask them to stand again because I want to invite all of the bishops of the United Methodist Church, active and retired, who are in the room to stand, please, and let us recognize you. The Jurisdictional College of Bishops had uh, their winter meeting here at Perkins uh, earlier, well, yesterday and today, and had lunch with the president of the university, and uh, delighted that several are able to stay and join us uh, for this luncheon. We also uh, have a number of members of the Perkins faculty who are in the room, and I would like to ask the members of the Perkins faculty and uh, staff to stand in your place and allow us to recognize you. If you're, if you're keeping score, by now you have discovered that the busiest person in the room is Bishop Max Whitfield, uh, who has stood for multiple invitations already. Max is Bishop in Residence at Perkins School of Theology, and he also serves as Director of the Center for Religious Leadership. I am delighted to have this chance uh, to welcome all of you on this very special occasion. I'm exceedingly grateful to the Reverend Connie Nelson, Director of Public Affairs and Alumni Relations to the Reverend Dr. Tim McLemore, who is the Associate Director to Amanda Rodenberg, who works with Tim and Connie in the Office of Public Affairs and Alumni Relations. And I'm also grateful to the Reverend Gary McDonald, to Pam Goolsby, Sharice Graham, and everybody who has organized a number of events associated with Minister's Week, including uh, this dinner tonight. I know there are going to be others who are joining us. Uh, this is the opportunity. If you look at the dessert at your place and you like the one at the vacant place next to you better, this is a good time to switch in case somebody comes in. While you're doing that, uh, I have the great honor of introducing to you the Reverend Susie Reedstrom, who is chair of the Perkins Alumni Council. She is the lead associate minister at Memorial Drive United Methodist Church in Houston, a clergy member of the Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. And uh, Susie is going to offer the invocation. Thank you, Dean Lawrence. It is really a privilege to add my welcome to Dean Lawrence's, and I specifically want to welcome you on behalf of the Perkins Alumni Council. It is a wonderful to be a part of Perkins, and all of you that have spent time here know what a special place this campus is, and we're thankful for our two guests this evening and all that they have done. I invite you to pray with me, please. Creator God, for this day of learning and the renewing of friendships, we give you thanks. You have placed in our midst those who by their lives reflect your justice and compassion. We ask you to continue to surround their lives, the lives of James Lyles and Ted Dodds Jr., with your grace and spirit. 
We're thankful, Lord, for Dr. Lyles, who pushed boundaries and did not let us forget that your love is for all. We're grateful for Reverend Dots, whose, wor whose words and life modeled a life of faith and justice. For these, we are thankful for this institution, for its professors and administrators and staff who prodded us to learn, who shared knowledge with us, and informed our faith and ministry as we went out in the world. We ask you to bless the food that is before us and the hands which prepared it. May it nourish our bodies that we might share your love and grace with the entire world. Amen. Amen. Enjoy your dinner. I am delighted that um, we are able to have as one of the participants in this 2015 Distinguished Alumni Award dinner uh, a person who has many titles. He's earned an academic PhD and that's important. He's a husband and father and that's important. He's the president of the university and that's pretty important. <laughs> but even more than that, he's a grandfather. Uh, please join me in welcoming the 10th president of Southern Methodist University, Dr. R. Gerald Turner. That is a, a very elevated uh, title, that last one. Uh, but uh, we have two little boys and three little girls. And uh, the three little girls are in Boston right now <coughs> uh, with snow as deep as they are tall. And so uh, they're not getting out very much these days. But we're delighted to have all of you here. And uh, many of you come back uh, from time to time, some maybe once a year. But we're always pleased to have you here, and uh, we know the world's right when Zan Holmes makes his way back to campus <laughs> and uh, checks in with us. We uh, are in our 100th anniversary and have had a great time uh, celebrating this centennial era. The opening in, on, I mean, the founding in April, on April the 17th of 1911, the opening on uh, September the 24th of 15. So we're on our way to the 100th anniversary of the opening and I hope you'll put September the 24th on your calendar and uh, that we think will be homecoming weekend also uh, but we're going to have a lot of events and everything that will be celebrating uh, the fact that the students showed up on September the 24th of 15. And each year of this centennial we have tried to celebrate what went on 100 years ago. So in 2011, we celebrated the founding of SMU, and we talked a lot about uh, laying cornerstones and things like that, but basically uh, looked at all of those individuals who really helped to get the university underway and how the church and the city came together uh, to build this university. And so as a result, uh, in 12 is when the campus master plan was developed. And so in 2012, we talked a lot about uh, the building of the campus and, uh, and how President Heyer had developed uh, such a grand master plan, <clears throat> chose Collegiate Georgian. Uh, he went all over Europe and the United States looking at, at uh, different kinds of uh, architecture for universities and like the University of Virginia the most. And so uh, obviously if you've been on that campus, you know Dallas Hall is Mr. Jefferson's uh, rotunda with wings. And, uh, and as a result, that's, we have followed it. In fact, I say all the time, one of the things I try to do is channel President Heyer uh, and maintain kind of what it was his plans were. 13, <clears throat> he hired Dorothy Ammon, who was the first librarian. And now we've got uh, Central University Library, Bridwell Library, Underwood Library, Hammond Library, uh, and all of those, but in the beginning was Dorothy Hammond. And a lot of ministers sent their books, and the first library was made up of a lot of ministers' libraries, as well as trying to buy some, and it was in, would eventually be in Dallas Hall. Fourteen, the first faculty were hired, so last year, we celebrated the year of the faculty and we had a great celebration at homecoming of all of the faculty uh, whose positions are endowed and we invited the people who endowed them uh, to come to that. And so obviously 
The Perkins faculty that have endowed positions and those who provided it were invited to it also. And that was the first time that we believe that's ever been done on the campus. And then this year is the, is the year of the students because they showed up in 15. So as a result, we've had a, a great celebration and we've all become so familiar with the centennial era that uh, when 16 rolls around, I'm going to feel a little bit like I've lost a good friend uh, because the centennial has been such a part of everything we've done for a good while. And so when we have a Distinguished Alumni Award event, particularly during this centennial era, uh, it is a great affirmation that we have had wonderful individuals who have provided leadership when they were here and gone on and used what they learned here uh, to be very important people uh, in our society and in the church and in all walks of life. And so I'm delighted to be here to celebrate these two tonight. And uh, I know that many of you uh, have known uh, both over their lifetimes and that uh, it'll give you a chance too to reflect on the times that they were here. None was here when it was founded. <laughs> but we have a, fac a faculty member here that I have often said he's the only person that I know who knew all 10 university presidents at SMU. And he said that I said it so often he was beginning to believe that maybe he did <laughs> uh, during that period of time. So all might not have been here at the very beginning, but we celebrate one who made sure that that, that beginning uh, clearly was not broad enough and wide enough and has made sure that those opportunities are here for the last uh, half of this century, really 60, over 60 years, maybe even close to 70 now. So also an individual who has served throughout Texas, we were just talking about Lubbock, and uh, I spent a couple of years there in a summer measuring cotton and grain sorghum in Lubbock, Texas. I've walked most of the county and that's why I really was serious about getting an advanced degree uh, so that uh, I could talk about it in past tense. But anyway, on behalf of the entire university, the Board of Trustees, some are, who are here tonight, I really thank all of you for your work and commitment to the Perkins School of Theology and for the crucial role that it plays in this university and in the church uh, and really around the world. And so it, great, it gives me a great uh, deal of joy to be able to celebrate the achievements of our graduates and to thank all of you, many of whom are graduates, for what you continue to contribute. Bill Lawrence is a great colleague and a wonderful leader on our campus beyond just Perkins. And so uh, we are very glad to have him provide that. And uh, at times we've had groups of very young deans and the provost and I always say, well, there's one adult in the room, we'll go talk to Bill. <laughs> so uh, I'm pleased to be here and I'll turn it over to the adult in the room, Bill Lawrence. Thank you very much, Gerald. Um, I, um, I really want now to invite the chair of the Perkins Alumni Council and the president of Southern Methodist University <laughs> to join me so that we can present uh, the 2015 Distinguished Alumni Awards to our two very special guests. We'll present both of the awards, and then after both awards have been presented, each of the recipients will in turn have an opportunity uh, to offer uh, remarks. Uh, so Susie yes. is right there. Yes. and. Dr. Lyles, I'm going to ask you to stand. Hillsman Jackson is the next most important person in the room. He's the one with the camera. And uh, Dr. Turner and Susie and I have the great pleasure to present to James V. Lyles the 2015 Distinguished Alumni Award Perkins School of Theology.
Thank you. Have a seat. We'll get back to you in just a minute. Betty? We also have the great privilege, Dr. Turner and Reverend Reedstrom and I, to present the 2015 Distinguished Alumni Award to the Reverend Ted Dotts. Ted's health, as many of you know, has been a challenge for an extended period of time. He recently entered into hospice care, and as recently as last Friday, we had hoped he might be able to be here personally. It turned out he is not able to be here, but his life partner, Betty Dots, is here. So we are presenting the 2015 Distinguished Alumni Award to Ted Dots. He is with us in spirit. He's all the way across the West Texas, but Betty is here, and Betty will receive it on Ted's behalf. As I've indicated, we're now going to have the opportunity to hear from each of the recipients. And I have the distinct privilege of being able to introduce the first of our two recipients. It's customary in introductions like this to give at least a little bit of biographical detail, and I want to care for that in the first moment. Dr. James Lyles is a native of Arkansas the child of sharecroppers, who went to Philander Smith College, excelled as a student there, and felt called to ministry, found his way to Perkins School of Theology through a journey about which I'll say a bit more. He will be able to say some more, and you can learn a lot more if you want to purchase and ask him to sign his memoir. Hard Trials, Great Tribulations, A Black Preacher's Pilgrimage from Poverty and Segregation to the 21st Century. Brand new book just released uh, in December of 2014. As I said, Dr. Lyles completed his undergraduate education at Philander Smith, came to Perkins, subsequently earned a Doctor of Ministry degree at McCormick Theological Seminary. But along the way, his ministries took him into pastoral positions of local churches, into the military chaplaincy, into service on a college campus as a college chaplain and teacher, into hospital chaplaincy as an executive of two different denominational agencies in the United Methodist Church, as a leader in church witness for decades. He now lives in retirement in Culver City, California, just outside of Los Angeles. I'm leaving out the core of the story that causes us, especially in this year, to honor Dr. Lyles. I first met him in 2005 when the university was, as is the common practice, welcoming members of the 50th graduating class, the Golden Mustangs, for commencement. It's been customary that the Golden Mustangs are those who graduate, who are marking 50 years since earning their undergraduate degree, but because there were five unique individuals who also graduated in 1955, these were Dr. Lyles and his four colleagues. They also were marking their 50th anniversary of graduation in 2005. To survive, the Reverend Dr. Cecil Williams, the Reverend Dr. James Lyles, and they were able to be here as part of that 50th anniversary. 2015, of course, is the 60th anniversary of Dr. Lyle's graduation. But it only happened because key leaders of Southern Methodist University, including some members of the Board of Trustees, among them the late Joe Perkins, the president of the university, Humphrey Lee, the dean of Perkins School of Theology, Merriman Cunningham, and a few other individuals, determined that it was long since past the time 
for desegregation to end at Southern Methodist University. And they conspired to change the world, or at least this part of it. It was a start. They conspired to change the world and brought five young men, African American men, who were enrolled at Perkins as the first African Americans to be candidates for degrees of any kind, ever, at Southern Methodist University. Southern Methodist University was desegregated before Duke, before Emory, before a lot of other church-related institutions. And there's a booklet that was published by the dean, Merriman Cunningham, titled simply, Perkins Led the Way, that tells that story. I've had the opportunity first to read a few portions of Dr. Lyle's memoir before it found its way into print. He is the person who needs to tell the story, but I want to share with you just a couple of elements from this memoir as a way of introducing him. It was customary, as Dr. Turner already indicated, that late September was when the semester began. And it was the tradition at Perkins that on the first Sunday of the academic year, therefore late September, the new students at Perkins would process into the sanctuary of Highland Park Methodist Church and be seated for morning worship at the 9 o'clock service as a body. So any students weren't involved in church life elsewhere would attend the service together. And the procession came in and Highland Park Methodist Church for the first time saw young black men marching into the congregation as part of that group. The phrase is mine, but it's a paraphrase of what Dr. Lyles reports. He and his four colleagues were seated, but not greeted. Yet they participated in a stellar worship experience, heard a powerful sermon by the Reverend Marshall Steele, who was then the pastor of Holland Park Methodist Church. And then after the nine o'clock service ended, Here's what Dr. Lyles wrote. When the service at Holland Park ended, the black students had another gig. We headed for St. Paul, the tall steeple black church in the inner city of Dallas. There we were greeted by the Reverend I.B. Loud and were celebrated by the congregation. Reverend Loud addressed the questions on the minds of the parishioners. Who are these young men? Where do they come from? With dispatch and simplicity, he spoke to our experiences. Our common experience was oppression. He introduced us to the congregation as an indication that a new day was dawning. He inducted us into the order of the sons of St. Paul. The members extended their hands, opened their hearts, and embraced us. The dining facilities were closed at Perkins on the weekend, the people of the local church took responsibility for seeing that the health and welfare of the Perkins students were insured and that these five young men had a bountiful Sunday dinner. But they continued to be exposed to hurt, harm, and danger. They saw what happened when a member of St. Paul, a woman named Julia, had a stroke and was taken to Methodist Hospital in Dallas. The family was met at the emergency entrance of Methodist Hospital in Dallas and were told, we do not admit Negroes. Julia died for lack of health care. In the early 1950s, Bishop William C. Martin, who presided over the Dallas area, was elected one of the presidents of the World Council of Churches. A great honor for the bishop, for the Methodist Church, for the city of Dallas, the Methodist Church organized a celebration for all the people of Dallas. All the Methodist people were invited. St. Paul Church and Ira Benjamin Loud led the way in mobilizing the black community, only to be told at the last minute that blacks would not be welcome. The question would ask, was asked, how could you look at 600 ticket-holding blacks in the face and say, not welcome? It was a humiliating experience for the blacks, a shameful act for whites, 
The honoree, Bishop Martin, apologized for that incident for the rest of his life. Pastor Loud, in a final plea, prayed, forgive them, forgive me for trusting them, and forgive them for not being trustworthy. We honor tonight Dr. James V. Lyles, 60 years after the year of his graduation from Southern Methodist University's Perkins School of Theology. We honor Dr. Lyles for having been one of the pioneers who withstood not only oppression, but humiliation and became an agent to change the world. Please join me in welcoming and greeting Dr. James V. Lyles. of December at mid-morning, but I had been up earlier at 3 o'clock when I was notified that my last living brother had died. And when he called, I was in grief and shock, but he lifted my spirit, and I thank you for that. It's dangerous to ask a retired preacher. <laughs> it's dangerous to ask a retired preacher <laughs> to do anything <laughs> but most particular to preach or speak. <laughs> I had the occasion of doing a toast for a friend of mine, Cornish Rogers, retired professor at Claremont. He said to me, I want you to do the toast, and I want you to be brief. <laughs> and before I could say anything, he continued and said, you know, you retired brothers and sisters don't get a chance to preach or speak, and when you do, you have a tendency to overdo it. <laughs> How sweet it is. <laughs> Dean has restricted me to 10 minutes. I want to first begin by introducing the members of my family. Would you stand? And I want to thank Roberto Escamilla. We were classmates. I think we shared a prize together along the way. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you. I came to this campus, I think, 63 years ago. It was a different campus. The big trees that you see here were little trees then. <laughs> Everything, I think, has changed 
for the good. This was a great seminary when we came. It is even better today. Let me tell you another thing that I enjoy telling. When the admission committee was selecting the five students, I was the last one selected. But Dr. Cunningham said that he would like to <coughs> consult with Mr. Perkins, and so he did. And Mr. Perkins said, you know, Dr. Cunningham, I don't know why they want to go to our school. Why don't they just go to their own schools? He said, but wait, if Bishop Smith says it's all right, it's all right with me. So he called Bishop Smith, and he said that the bishop must have been solving some horrendous problem, because he came to the telephone and he said, yes, Marilyn, we said, Bishop, we have admitted four black students. We would like to admit one more. The bishop said, how many have you admitted? He said, four. The bishop said, one more won't make any difference, and slammed the telephone down. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here tonight. How many minutes do I have left? Uh, Sixty years. <laughs> I'm here tonight to tell you that it did make a difference. The administration of the university, the seminary, the students, and the faculty did everything they could to see that the experiment of desegregating the university would be a success. <clears throat> and the admissions committee, Dean, were wise enough to choose young men who on first sight liked each other. They respected each other. We played together, we studied together, we prayed together, we worshiped together, we fought together, but we learned to love each other. And because of that, we supported each other. <coughs> and that was the difference that it made in my life. There were things that happened which were unpleasant. But never were any of those things assigned to any of the students or any of the faculty or any of the administration. We work together in making sure that when we came to the university, our goal 
was to graduate with a first class theological education. And that we would never allow anything to distract us from achieving that goal. Let me say this and then I'm going to be finished. Practically every week there was some problem to be solved relative to the black students. And you know, you don't mind problems because if we didn't have problems, we wouldn't be solving anything and we wouldn't have any reason for living. It would just be so frustrating and so depressing. <laughs> so we had problems. And the dean, he promised us that he would not make any decisions for us and he would not impose his decisions upon us. So we would come into his office. I think it was smaller than yours today. <laughs> <laughs> and there were only five chairs in the office. And we would sit in front of him. He wouldn't sit behind his desk. He came from behind his desk and he sat on the trash can. What a symbol. And when we heard the problem and we worked it out by listing all of the solutions and then we selected the best solution and committed ourselves to use that solution to solve the problem as I look back over it that ploy of sitting on the garbage can was the greatest technique to get us to feel free to participate with him to accept the decision he had already made. <laughs> Thank you. the name of Merriman Cunningham's booklet about that situation in the early 1950s was Perkins led the way. Apparently, Merriman Cunningham led the way for me to get a bigger office than he had. <laughs> <laughs> the story continues. It is now my great privilege to introduce Perkins alumnus, the Reverend Bobby McMillan, who has agreed to be present with us tonight so that he might introduce the uh, 2015 recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award. And Bobby McMillan will do that both by telling us about Ted Dots and by introducing Betty Dots. Bobby? After you finished, Dr. Lyles, Betty patted me and said, that is going to be hard to follow. <laughs> and I want to say it is an honor, an honor to stand where you have just stood and 
told, be a part of the story of Perkins, a school that has meant so much to you and means so much to all of us who have been students here. Today it felt so good to be back here to walk on the campus and to be at the chapel <coughs> for worship. And then before that we went to chapel, I went into the library, which I always love to go into, and went to the uh, exhibit for honoring Albert Outler. And what a joy that was because he was still teaching here when Ted and I entered in 1961. I have been asked to introduce my good friend for 53 years, Ted Dots, and my good friend Betty Dots, who will be representing Ted, and how we both wish that he were here tonight to receive this honor, but it's a joy to be able to do this. Life with Ted has been a journey for 53 years. And I want to tell you about a journey that we took just most recently, and then I will share why I think he is a worthy recipient of this honor. Ted and I talked a few weeks ago about taking a time to be with one another, quality time that we hadn't had in a long time. And that time is very special and revered right now. So he said to me one day, he said, Mac, why don't we take a trip to Plainview by going on the back road from Lubbock to Plainview and eating at an Asian restaurant there? Ted and I always travel together in our early years of life to seminars, to various places of lectureships, and had lots of good memories. And this trip this time was on January the 7th, the day after Epiphany. And it harkens back to years ago when Ted and I went during the season of Epiphany to the College of Preachers in Washington, D.C. to study preaching together and to be in a practicum on preaching. So we took this trip, and how do you take a back road trip from Lubbock to Plainview? Well, Ted found one. <laughs> I knew how to get there on Highway 400. Ted said, let's do 179, and we took a back road all the way through Lubbock, getting to the back road to Plainview. <laughs> I think he did it because it was a way of extending the journey together. And what a journey it has been. It began in the fall of 61 here at this school. We were out together. The first time I remember seeing Ted, it was at a picnic, welcoming new students. I already knew Betty, but I did not know Ted. And from that time, our journey of friendship began. So to honor him tonight, I'm gonna to try to honor what I think Ted would have preferred. He does not like credentialing. He does not like accolades. He does not see any sense in a lot of affirmation and glowing words. So I'm going to try to guard against that and honor the Ted Dots that I knew through the years. So what I want to talk to you about is the word distinguished. Ted loves to take words and work with them and get the root meaning and help you see a meaning there. So I thought, well, what would Ted do with this word? Well, I did a lot of research, what I could, and I found one definition that I think really does set the, what distinguished means for Ted. One definition of it is to set apart. Now that is not meaning to set apart for privilege or to be set apart as I'd like you are a much better, but set apart for a calling. And the Ted Dots that I know was looking at how are we set apart for our calling. So I'm going to ask you to think of the things, those of you who knew Ted, what set him apart for you, which you would say this makes him distinguished. Now for me, the thing that set him apart and earns him this award is the fact that he was, saw himself as set apart to serve. Had Ted been here tonight as the pastor of this congregation, he would be out seeing that all of you were being served first at the tables, because I saw him do that a lot. At any time there was a, a dinner we went to, at the church or wherever, Ted would want to make sure everybody was being served and taken care of. I think he took seriously the biblical understanding as, it, as the word deacon evolved, one who is set apart to wait on tables, to sit at there. So Ted would have been serving us at the tables tonight, seeing that we are served. But I want to tell you another aspect of his servanthood, 
And this I experienced with him on a trip, another journey. He and I were on a seminary visit to St. Paul's School of Theology when he and I both were serving on the board of ordained ministry. We were there to visit a, one student, a woman student that was there in the seminary. And we stayed in a rat trap motel. I will never forget this. The sheets were not clean. Oh, Betty no. would have been beside herself because of the cleanliness. But it, we, we remember, and on this trip to Plainview, Ted was remembering the trip to St. Paul. But a memory I have of that was the flight back to Lubbock. We boarded the plane in Kansas City, and as we were seated in our place, uh, coming onto the plane a little bit late was an African-American older woman with two children who were very clearly victims of abuse. Their faces were horribly distorted, their bodies were distorted. They were, had been so physically abused that they were just, it was just physical as well as emotionally evident. She made her way to her seat very, with a lot of difficulty with these two children. In the flight, as we were getting ready to land into Dallas to change planes for our trip back on into Lubbock, Ted turned to me and he said, Mac, why don't you and I stay on the plane a little longer and help that woman with those two children get off the plane because she's going to need help. So we did. And when we got off the plane, we had some time and we started visiting with her. And Ted, knowing how to ask good questions, as he always did, asked her to tell us what she could of her story and these children. She told us these were not her children. She had read about them in the paper. She was a foster mother and she had read about them and said these two children, and she told us all the abuse they'd been through, she said, I made up my mind, I'm going to go up there and get those children and give them a home. Her family, friends, everybody warned her that her life would be a living hell from then on. And her response was, I don't care. I just know that those babies need love, and I intend to give them love. So as we listen, we would have never had that experience except for that servant nature of Ted that said we need to stay and learn more and help, which sets him apart as distinguished, one who is set apart to serve and to empower those who are powerless and to give hope for those who are trying to give hope to others. Now there's another aspect that sets him apart and that is Ted's dedication to simplicity. Any of you who ever heard, have heard him no, he is gifted at taking depth when making it more profoundly mysterious and awakening wonder and questions when the most simple way of speaking and putting together words in his sermons, his lectures, and however he opens our thoughts. But he does it with simplicity and very brief, much briefer than I am. <laughs> but... When you heard him, all of us who have heard him lecture, preach, always the connecting thing we say is, how does he do such depth with such simplicity? But that's not the only aspect of his simplicity. Look at him and remember how he dressed. Ted never dressed with ostentatious colors and style didn't mean that much to him. Simplicity of dress just what is necessary and essential. Simplicity of food. He became a vegetarian, much to my chagrin, because I love to eat, and he used to be so much fun to travel with because we ate great food. Well, he still does, but it, it, it's limited now to more, not what I would eat. Uh, when you travel with him, I have been on trips with him where he would bring breads that he had made, Muffins, I remember some muffins that we had on a trip out to the Benedictine Monastery of Christ in the desert, and it was like eating sawdust. But it was wonder, it, but it was nourishing and it kept, it was what we needed. Simplicity of diet, simplicity. So as I think about him and his simplicity of style, his gift of taking the profound and helping us want, come to the awe and wonder of the message, I think of the Shaker hymn, 
It is a gift to be simple. Mm. Listen to these words. Some of you may not know who I'm talking, this Ted Dossier that I'm talking about, but I hope you're going to learn about him as I tell you a little more. And this hymn speaks so much of this Ted that I know. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight. Till by turning, turning, we come round right. Ah, uh, that sets Ted Dots apart for me. He, he gives a visible incarnation of that word, the gift to be simple, to come down where we ought to be, not above, but serving. And finally, what sets him apart? He courageously opens doors. During the 17 years that Ted was pastor at St. John's United Methodist Church, and then I followed Ted as pastor there, during those 17 years, that church went through many, many transitions, but one of them was a physical transformation. The church was completely renovated, the sanctuary was rather, for the installation of a magnificent Holt Comp pipe organ. The liturgical setting for the chancel area is in every sense of the word, a setting that emphasizes word and sacrament. And Ted was the pastor during that time when that was done. And part of the re, uh, renovation was the installation of some beautiful glass etched doors at the front of the sanctuary. And outside in the hall where there's a description of the pipe organ and that project, there is a sign there about the doors. And the doors, this sign reads this, the Northex doors and etched glass with cross and flame are in honor of Ted Dots, who opens doors. Mm -hmm. And man, does he open doors in so many ways. He opens doors for understanding and learning by the questions he asks. One of the names I have given him periodically is Rabbi, Rabbi Dots. Rabbis know how to ask questions that probe you to search for an answer, but not an easy answer. And Ted it was a, is a master at asking those kind of questions. If you travel with him, and it's a long trip, you're not going to talk about mundane trivialities. You'll be given a question, and you talk about that question, and then the challenge for you if you're talking is you also need to, ch he challenges you to listen to the people in the car so that you can be able to respond and know what they have said. In his, one of the things that I heard recently from Ted, that several heard that are from Lubbock, Ted was asked to speak at Second Baptist Church on death and dying from the perspective of a dying man. And in the course of his talk, he said that one of the callings that all of us have in our life is we must listen, listen. Well, that's the way he opened the door to so many of us by listening to us and helping us find hope and new understandings. But other ways he's opened the doors is he's opened the doors, as I told you already in the story about the lady on the plane, he opens the doors for the maligned, the oppressed, the ostracized. He opened the door at St. John's for the first African Americans uh, to be in, intern to come. Lynn Mims was the first African American intern to serve at St. John's. There are women in the Northwest Texas Conference and many other conferences who have had that door open for them to help them claim that we are pastors in the truest sense of the word, we are people in the truest sense of the word, due to Ted making sure that they had a voice, and he was always a voice for them. So he opened doors for the oppressed, the ostracized, those who are ignored, those who have been told you have no worth. 
He continues to open those doors for gays, lesbians, transgendered, and, and with Betty, side by side with them, and he is continuing, even to this day, to weekly open the doors to the poor who come to St. John's asking for food help from the food voucher program from the food bank. He knows how to help those who are powerless find their voice. And he has never retreated behind the door of silence as much as some have tried to silence him, and he has been face to face with power that wanted to say, you have no voice. But he refused to let that door be slammed in his face. Now there's one thing I want to just conclude with. On that trip to Plainview, Ted and I were talking about his talk at Second B, or Second Baptist. And he was just asking me what I thought, if there was anything I would say that he need, might want to think about. And I said, do you remember when Ryan Price, who is the pastor of Second Baptist, do you remember when he asked you about the naming you do in memorial services? Ryan Price, the pastor there, said, Ted, I know that at memorial services and funerals, you always have a part in the service called the naming. And Ted explained that's part of the liturgy that we have in our book of worship and in the hymnal. And he explained the theology of the naming. Well, Ryan said, well, you always give a name to the person you're remembering. And Ted confirmed that. And then he said, Ryan turned to Ted and said, well, what name would you give yourself? And I was waiting to hear what Ted would say. And he did what he always does. He diverted because he would not name himself. He will listen to you, but you do not get into who Ted is, not with what he, with what he will say. So I told him, I said, you know, Ted, you remind me of a, something that I heard years ago at a seminar I was at. The person was talking about T.S. Eliot's book, of Old Possum's book of, Poss of Practical Cats, and the musical Cats is based on that. In that story, or in Eliot's book, he tells that a cat has three names. There's the name given to the cat by the owners or at birth, Ted Dots. There are the names that other cats give him. I call him Rabbi, Betty calls him Teddy, and others of us have their name for him. But there is one name that that cat has. And anytime you see a cat lying in the sun, basking at a window, just looking like they are in control, you can be really assured that they're thinking about the name that they know, but that is a name that they will never reveal to anyone else. That is their secret name. I just wish and hope that one of those days, I learn what Ted's name is for himself. But for the present, we name him Distinguished, Set Apart. What a joy, what an honor to be a part of 53 years of friendship and to be able to introduce my good friend and embrace his wife who will receive this honor for him. Thank you, Bobby. Well said. Teddy would be embarrassed, of course, <laughs> with all the nice things said. It is with great honor that I stand here tonight with so many uh, friends and comrades and how wonderful to see you. It is with sadness that I do this instead of Teddy. 
Uh, he is much more eloquent, but I am going to read what he has written. Uh, and he will, as he would have said, after 55 years of marriage, he knows that uh, I will probably add things. <laughs> Bobby mentioned many of the qualities that, uh, in fact, uh, numerous qualities, thank you, Bobby, that Ted, uh, Teddy does have. And to add that he's very disciplined, both in his studies and in taking care of his health. He does have bone cancer, and where that came from, I don't know. That's sort of a joke, because nobody has ever exercised more, been a vegetarian, and taken care of his health more than Teddy. But he does have bone cancer. Uh, he also, though, one thing that attracted me was Teddy was a searcher, and still is. And he searches for what is real, what is important, what is the best. And it is through that, then, he learned to ask questions, many questions. And it was it, the joy he found when he came to Perkins, and Perkins could answer many of those questions, even surpass him in his questions. And it is true that it, the social action was very important to him, and still is. I think I remember somewhere reading that John Wesley said there is no holiness without social holiness. Got it. <laughs> All right. Well, that is one of his callings. And he, we started from the very first, ministering to Jim Kelps with the Mexicans, and then on into to Abilene, where he got involved with our three Methodist black churches and got in trouble, as he always has. <laughs> and, but what joy! It was the right thing to do. And that has gone on because he got involved then in helping divorced people with the GLBT community, gay, lesbian, transgender community, and that with the divorced people and with women. Yes, they can preach. I'm not doing it, by the way. <laughs> this isn't preaching. And with the elderly. And every time he would get into these issues, <clears throat> you always lose a few people that cannot go along with what you feel is your calling. Needless to say, he has caused disruption in churches, and he certainly has in the Northwest Texas Conference. <laughs> but. That was his calling. He also has started many groups to study theology, to study great books, to learn to think. And he's also, uh, in addition to those groups, started support groups galore, those in grief, those with children with GLBT issues, those that are parents of children or elderly, and now people that are dying, support groups. But his studies awakened his mind 
to needs and gave new pathways to action then. So Katie would say Perkins is his favorite church institution. And he and I both thank you that you would consider him as distinguished and honor him this way. And we appreciate our friends from Dallas that are here and from Lubbock. I can't believe they came all the way. But how much we do appreciate them. But I'd also like to say thank you to the cooks, to the servers, and to the janitors that also help make this night, as well as the people at the table. As he said, the bone cancer it has made it unable for him to attend tonight. But cancer is not able to stop his prayers of gratitude, <coughs> both for you, for Perkins, for the joy of learning, and for being able to follow the light. Now, he has written this. A single thought generates my gratitude for Perkins School of Theology. Always new creation. After I began Perkins in 1961, I realized that Perkins turned students into information seedbeds. Therefore, I left seminary in 1964 with grateful confidence that my information seedbed would supply me with an endless curriculum, always new creation. However, I needed lots of improvement because new creation occurs when information becomes action. This is a hard lesson to learn. Information is so grand, one may revel in the information and ignore the action. For instance, in 1962, Professor Joe Allen suggested Reinhold Niebuhr's, you probably know this one, The Nature and Destiny of Man, as one source for the credo. The credo. <laughs> mm. In those days, it was the male preacher boys only. The wives were out providing the finances. <laughs> but during those days, up early in the morning, late at night, papers everywhere, discussions with other students, and the wives were the forgotten entity. We did not get count very much during those days. So cradles were not my favorite thing. <laughs> great the information, though, in those two volumes, and great a central theme of that information. This is volume two, page 316. There is a new peril of evil on every new level of the good. Abundant treasures of information about new levels of good we humans can create. It set me off so much I missed, neglected, and did not soak up the peace about the new peril of evil. The sweep of information about the new level of good dimmed the call to action. 
So Perkins sent Theodore Hill. Theodore Hill was a crippled black man who cut lawns during the day and he worked as an SMU janitor at night. As a former janitor, Teddy, this is Teddy writing, I sometimes joined Mr. Hill as we buffed the floors. We became close enough that he sent his daughters to visit Betty and me in our one room, very small, <laughs> thin walls, <laughs> smell what your neighbor was cooking, oh. <laughs> apartment. Some of you have seen that too, I can tell. <laughs> Mr. Hill was a good man. Two jobs he worked to put his girls through college. Then, Doc Jones managed my election to student body president. It was civil rights, 1963 and 1964. The student council set out to integrate the businesses along Hillcrest and the barber shop in the Humphrey Lee Student Center. And by the way, when they went to the student center, I remember he came in and said, well, I didn't think through everything. Because I went up there and to let the barber know we need to integrate this barber shop. And the barber looked at Teddy and said, but I don't know how to cut black hair. Teddy hadn't done his background work on that. So that's how it was back then. In addition, the council took up the mission of inviting the black janitors and their spouses to the end of the year banquet and dance. That mission required convincing Mr. Hill and the other janitors, black janitors, to attend. Once we got their reluctant permission, we appealed for their attendance as far up the ladder as the president of SMU. <laughs> On the night of our banquet in 1964, a few of the black janitors and their wives attended. None of them danced, but they all ate and they smiled a lot. The next February, when I returned for Minister's Week, I visited Mr. Hill. Of course, I brought up the banquet which was the last time I'd seen him since the June graduation. I wanted him to tell me what a grand time he'd had and how good he felt. Instead, with a marvel of a smile, he did the Perkins thing. He moved me from information to action. Always the new creation. He told me that the white supervisors angered at filling in for the black janitors, raised harassment up a notch. However, he said it was okay. The blacks had expected it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hill led me from information to action. The action of preparing for a new peril of evil. Once a new level of good appeared. I suppose Professor Allen expected I would get it for my credo. I did not get it for my credo. I did get it for the constant challenge of my life as a pastor. There is a new peril of evil on every new level of the good. Get clear about that, and the always new creation calls forth risk on the gospel. God is always making the wrong into right, which is the front, center, and the core 
of the attempt to be a Christian. Perkins, always a new creation, from the best of the professors to the lowest of the janitors. 1961 to 2015. Thank you all. Dr. Zen Holmes, don't sit down. Uh, when there is a distinguished alum in the house, it seems appropriate that closing word come from him. Zen, will you bless us and send us on our way? give thanks to God for the privilege of being here tonight to hear presentations from those of you who presented them and uh, it just simply reminds me of how blessed we are and that we have one another. And on occasions like this, we go forth in gratitude, thanksgiving to God for the gift of each other, but above all, for the gift of God's grace, which sustains us and keeps us and uses us to be a blessing unto others. In the name of God, the creator and God, the sustainer and God, the redeemer, let us go forth to claim the brand new future that God is ever offering us on the hills of everything that happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.